Good morning, after the last church. I hope that I found you all well this morning, rested in God and meditating on His scriptures and on His power and, uh, and your hearts filled with courage in God. If not, uh, bear with me as I bring God's word to us because one of the things about God's word is that it fills us with courage and with hope as we meditate on Him. And so this morning, uh, as I bring the scriptures, I really feel like it's a timely, timeless word. I feel like this word is a word for the church right now, at this time, at this day and age. And so um, I've entitled it, By My Spirit. And so the, the big theme that I want to look at this morning is the inadequacy of man. The, the inadequacy of man in terms of doing anything good for God, anything eternal. And how we need God's Spirit to do His work and things that are of eternal value. And so in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, we read that the Lord God formed the man. This is when He was creating Adam. He formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a life, a living creature. Man on his own, as we see, uh, is just dust. That's all that he really is. And dust is something that's lowly. Dust is something that is worthless. And, uh, you know, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, uh, the Lord actually puts a consequence on Adam for his sin. And he says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of, you, out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. See, there's no nothing of eternal value in dust there's nothing of eternal value in man there's nothing that god can actually use in us to build his kingdom and to do the things that he needs to do um, there's nothing that will last when you when it comes to dust and so we're really needing a solution and the lord says to the serpent in the garden as well he says, because you've done this, because the serpent was the one who deceived man. He says, because you've done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and above, above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Dust you shall eat. And man is made out of dust. And so, just to say this, that the devil likes to hang around dust because he eats it. Andrew Silly spoke to us about this um, a few years ago. And it's just a great revelation for us. But the devil loves dust. And he, uh, dust really represents man on his own, in his own efforts, his own strength, without the Spirit of God. And so the devil thrives on man's efforts without God. And I think this, is, this will be a temptation for mankind at this time. When the world is in great need, man will jump forward and give forward his best efforts, his solutions. And uh, flesh on its own can't do anything good. You remember in the Old Testament, I think it was Genesis chapter uh, around 11, I think, and the men of the uh, tried to build the tower that extended up to heaven so that they could make a name for themselves and not be scattered throughout the earth. The tower was called Babel. And again, this is an attempt uh, of man to try and do something awesome on his own and dust just produces more dust. And so we see that uh, God frustrates their plans. And so their big grand idea comes to nothing. And so in the book of Zechariah chapter 4, there's this governor and his name is Zerubbabel. And uh, he's tasked with, an, uh, with a really huge task at that time. Israel had been chucked out of the promised land. And now they'd come back into the promised land after many years of discipline and the temple had been destroyed, and, and this governor was tasked with, the, with rebuilding the temple of God. And there were huge obstacles in his way, and this was almost like just a, a daunting task. Like, how are they going to do this? And the, the word of the Lord comes to him and says, Zerubbabel, this is the word of the Lord to you. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. I really feel like that's a word of God to us, to the church at this time, is that we're not going to fix this world by might, nor by power of man, and man's ingenuity, man's science, all these things. It's by my spirit, says the Lord. And so, you know, in the garden, when God formed Adam, he formed him out of dust. But then it says something interesting. He said that, 
He formed the man from the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a life-giving creature. You see, in, uh, in the Bible, we are shown so clearly that flesh gives birth to flesh. That uh, man can't do anything of substance by himself. He needs the Lord. But man constantly falls into this trap of, of relying on his own strength and building up armies for himself and horses and chariots and all these things that we've mentioned before. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes, he says, just as we've been, just as though we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. The image of the man of heaven, who was this man? We know his name to be Jesus Christ, the living one, the one upon whom we saw at his baptism, the Holy Spirit coming down as a dove and rested on Jesus and remained upon him. And from there, Jesus was driven into the wilderness by the, by the Spirit of God. And he came out of the wilderness by, by the power of, of the Spirit. And so the whole of Jesus' ministry was summed up by the, the, the Holy Spirit being upon him. Before his baptism, we see he lived a kind of a normal life, it was sinless and pure, but, but there weren't any acts of power recorded. After he comes, after the baptism, and he comes back out of the wilderness, we see the Spirit of God descends upon him, and suddenly he's doing the mighty works that the world still talks about today. See, on his own, man has nothing to offer God. And so the Lord says in Acts uh, chapter 2, he says, In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Because flesh on its own can't do anything worthwhile for the kingdom of God. And so as God's spirit comes upon us, suddenly we are transformed into be, being people who can do amazing things for the kingdom of God. So a couple of examples. Samson in the Old Testament, we read about this man who had this great strength. What was the secret to his strength? Delilah kept on asking him, what is the secret to your strength? Well, if it was his great physique and Arnold Schwarzenegger type build, there wouldn't have been much of a secret to his strength because they were, we would have been able to see it. So, you know, it's very possible that Samson didn't even have big muscles at all. And the secret was that at times it says in Judges chapter 14 that the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. And although he had nothing in his hand, he tore this young lion to pieces. At other times, the Spirit of the Lord would rush upon him. He'd take the, the, a bone of a, of a donkey, a jawbone, and he would kill a thousand men. You know, we actually read something very similar of David. And David was a shepherd boy. And there wasn't too much to make us marvel at him outwardly. Yet, it says that, that uh, Samuel the prophet finds David. He takes a horn of oil and anointed him, David, in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. I love that phrase rushed upon David from that day forward. And it's after that we see David doing great and mighty works. He kills Goliath, uh, a monster of a man, nine foot tall. You see, in the something similar is like in Acts chapter 2, we read about the New Testament church and how the Holy Spirit rushes upon the New Testament church, rushes upon them all who were in the upper room, all 120. And we read these phrases that the Holy Spirit came like a violent wind, just symbolizing the power of God. The loudness of his presence, drowning out doubts and uncertainties. Timidity, hesitancy, weakness are swallowed up by God's greatness. And there's tremendous zeal and courage that is unleashed upon the, the people of God. We see that flames of fire came and rested upon their heads. And fire always symbolizes God's presence. God's people are to be people of his presence. We are to be people who declare the wonders of God. And this is what happened in Acts chapter 2 as they were filled with the Holy Spirit. In Ezekiel chapter 2, we see how the Lord tells Ezekiel, he says, Son of man, stand up on your feet and I will speak with you. And I really feel like the Lord is summoning the church right now to stand up to her feet. But then he's in, in uh, chapter 2 verse 2 of Ezekiel, he says, And as he spoke with me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking. And I feel like at this time, we, this is not something we can do by our own might or power, but we need the Spirit of God. And we need the Spirit of God, in fact, to empower us standing and counting for Him. There's no service that we can offer to God on our own that will be adequate. And that's why we need to be anointed with His Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. The church is going to, be doing anything of uh, 
of substance at this time. It has to be through the Spirit. And to end off, in Revelation chapter 22, it says, The Spirit and the Bride, that is the church, say, Come. Come and let anyone who hears say, Come. And let, let the one who is thirsty, Come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life, Take without price. The Spirit and the Bride, together, that's us working with the Holy Spirit as the church, working with the Holy Spirit, say come. And the world will come. And they who are thirsty will come and drink of the water of life. God bless you all. Be filled with His Spirit.